All right, I'm here today, so I want to talk about building compassion. And the question, the more general question I want to get to is, how do we get more compassion in the world? And from here, it's a simple question that comes from our leaders. Obviously, the Dalai Lama, I had the good fortune to um, meet him back in October and at, have breakfast with him, and, and it's a, like in another world. And he obviously makes that question, how do we get more compassion in the world? But also, I would argue, when the tragedies that have just occurred around our country and around the world, for example, West Texas, with the explosion of West Texas, President Obama has put courage and compassion together in the forefront of his comments. If you go and Google his comments, you'll see that those two words, courage and compassion, of the residents of West Texas and other communities are the things that he brings to the forefront. But no one's talking about how do we get more of it, right? They talk about when it happens. So it's a question from our leaders. It's a question that comes from our non-governmental organizations, from our organizations that we call civil society, our civic organizations, like the Charter for Compassion or the Compassion Action Network. Their job is to spread the word of compassion and actually have action to it on the grammar school level, the university level, and cities and towns. And they're trying to make universities become universities of compassion. And Western Connecticut State University just became the second university in the country to become a university of compassion through the Charter uh, for Compassion. It's also a simple question that comes from our past, from Einstein. And what's amazing is that Einstein has this question, but he does it as he always does, or always did, in a cool way. Right? He says, we have this sense of independence the sense of separateness that he calls an optical delusion of our consciousness. And he says that keeps us separate. But that consciousness, that optical delusion needs to go away. It needs to evaporate. It needs to disappear because it creates a prison for us. And he says, how do we get beyond this optical delusion? He argues that we need to widen our circle of compassion. So he talks about widening the circle of compassion, but he doesn't say how. So it's still left, as Einstein always did, as a question for us to pursue. So it comes from our leaders, our non-governmental organizations, it comes from our past. But it also comes from our future. Those are my three little boys uh, walking away. And for me, it really rang home hard from them. For the fact that we live just a few miles away from Sandy Hook, Newtown where that tragedy occurred on 12-14. And on the East Coast, we also had Hurricane Sandy that had massive destruction, but also the Boston Marathon. And so my three boys were asking me, why is there so much evil in the world, Dad? Why, why do we have to be worried? Why do we have to have these lockdown drills at school? And they know about Sandy Hook because we live right there. They know about the Boston Marathon. We lived there for a few years up in Boston as well. So it's a question that comes from our future, comes from our kids as well. So how do we do it? How do we build it? I argue we weave it. Uh, one of my close friends uh, who's a successful businessman, he knows I do a lot of different things at the same time. And he goes, how do I prioritize? And I told him, I don't prioritize. I said, it's the wrong thing to do. I weave. So when I have a bunch of projects coming up, I try to tie them together. So if they're tied together, if one gets a little weak, the others, if I tie them correctly, will keep that other one going and keep it strong and move it along. So I always talk about weaving. And we weave quite a lot, if you think about it. We weave to catch our dreams in the dream weavers. We weave to innovate. That picture was taken while I was in the Gobi Desert in China. I was there to help the Chinese uh, overcome some of their water problems that they have, both in terms of desertification as well as flooding. And I took that picture because I saw hundreds of people in the Gobi Desert at the edge putting these one meter by one meter hay squares, woven hay squares together down on the desert. And I was, what, what's this? This is to stop desertification. And by the way, it's working in the Gobi Desert. So what happens is that the little rain that happens gets caught like a sponge with the hay squares. And as the winds blow the seeds of plants, they get caught in the hay squares, the water's there, and guess what grows back? Right? They're stopping desertification with a simple weaving tool to innovate. So we weave to catch our dreams, we weave to innovate, and we weave for strength. This is the Sagrada Familia. 
in Barcelona, Spain. It's a bunch of pillars inside a church, and they, what they did is they wove the pillars together to give it such great strength. Beautiful, too. We weave, if you think about it, we weave our clothes, chairs, buildings. We weave it for strength. Now, how do we build more compassion? How do we weave it? I would argue we weave institutions and people who care together. And if you're like my boys, when you think about weaving people together and institutions, you, of course, I know you do, Dan, think of zombies, right? You all think of zombies. Well, I asked my, my, my center dude, uh, I don't have a middle child, I have a center dude, I asked him, what, why did he think of zombies? And he, t he drew me a picture of a zombie hug. And I said, where did you get this from? And he says, Dad, we play this game called Plants versus zombies. And I said, we do, do we? And so I asked him to explain it to me and to show me. And what was really interesting, I know a lot of the college students play it. That's what I found, found out. You have to cultivate plants, sunflowers, tomato plants, whatever it is, to stop the zombies from coming into your house. So you have to grow things. And I thought, that is brilliant. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to cultivate compassion to stop the zombies of antipathy, hate, and ignorance from eating our society away. And unfortunately, as a former counterintelligence agent, I've seen what the lack of compassion can do and how it can make zombies out of people and how it can eat away at society. So for me, this Plants vs. Zombies is an okay game to play. It has a good lesson uh, to be had in here. So. How do we do that at Western Connecticut State University? I'm going to say five ways that we're weaving people and institutions together to build compassion, to get more compassion in the world. And the first thing we did was become a university of compassion. And here, I'll just highlight three things. One, we have courses where compassion is woven into the fabric of those courses. And in Honors 100, for example, it's called The Nature of Inquiry. And I use His Holiness's book, The Universe in a Single Atom, to weave in science and compassion into societal concerns. It's a great book. It's an easy way to do that. Students really grab on, onto the notion. Anybody can do this. It is not hard. What we also did is we started a student club called the C Compassion and Creativity Club. And those students have done amazing work. It just happened in October, by the way. And what they have done is th they have kind of taking care of the two Sandys, we call them, around us, Sandy Hook and Sarah, Hurricane Sandy. They have volunteered for various organizations around Sandy Hook. They have uh, gone to New Jersey a number of times to help people who had Hurricane Sandy and have been hit really hard by Hurricane Sandy. So that Creativity and Compassion Club not only does stuff on campus, it go out into the communities. Another thing that has occurred is that students have taken this on their own, this idea of compassion and creativity, and woven it together in ways I couldn't even imagine. For example, one student, Alexis Kukos, she decided to go to the Danbury Fair Mall, the largest mall in our area, and have a fashion show called Compassion Through Fashion. And she convinced all the stores, including Macy's, JCPenney, the works, to donate goods, all for the purpose of raising money for Habitat for Humanity. It's just snowballing on. And it doesn't take much. It takes a little bit of push. And then students, you get out of their way, and they do some magical things. The next thing we've done is, that's a picture, aerial view of our city that Western Connecticut State University is in, Danbury. And we've introduced the concept of Danbury becoming the 13th city of compassion in the United States. There are already 12. And so, what we're doing is we're meeting with the city council again this month to go over 36 different ways of how they can have projects to become a city of compassion. And why we came up with 36, I asked the students to go to those 12 cities that are already in existence, come up with three projects from each of those 12 cities that you think would meet Danbury's needs, and then the city council can choose from there about how they move on. So a simple way of getting it out outside the university and into the community. The next thing I'm doing, I'm working with one of the mothers of Sandy Hook. Uh, her name is Scarlett Lewis. And what we're trying to do through the Jesse Lewis Foundation 
uh, her son was Jesse Lewis, is to weave compassion into the Common Core curriculum. And I'm going to steal a little bit of Oliver Wendell Holmes here. He said, some people know facts, others, the more wise, learn how facts live. And through this kind of adaptation to the Common Core, we want to promote that idea of not just having students learn the facts, but learn, make them learn how they live in the real world. And how are we doing that? I came up with a, a system called the five C's. Basically, real quick, it's conceptual learning, compassion, creativity, courage, and constraint. And what we've done is created already a K through second curriculum, and it's on space. So we want them to learn this concepts of space, but, and also some values of compassion. And as, as an example, let me just give you one quick one. We are introduced dark matter and dark energy to K through second graders in a fun way, right? Because if you think about it, dark matter makes up about approximately 27% of the universe. Dark energy, 68%. For those of you who are mathematicians, that's 95% of the universe. And by the way, 95% of the universe is invisible. We can only see 5% of the matter. So they learn about invisibility. But then this is the key about values and compassion. 27% dark matter is the glue that keeps us all together in the universe. 68% dark energy is trying to rip us apart. So what they're learning is not only basic pie charts and math, but they're also learning the idea that the good in this world, the good in the universe, is at least as twice as strong as the bad. The good that keeps us together is at least as twice as strong as those that try to tear us apart. Mm -hmm. So through their curriculum, they're not only getting the common core, the concepts, but also the values that we hope that every person uh, can get. And so for me, the way I see the common core, it should be a launching pad for our students not a landing zone. And unfortunately, it has become a landing zone. So we're trying to increase the Common Core standards and increase these, these ideas of exposure to values such as compassion. We also started having uh, conferences in the community. We just had, uh, it, last month, Compassion and Creativity in the Community Conference, where we had five different communities come together who are usually separate from each other. For example, we had the business community, health community, spiritual community, government, and education. National, state, and local leaders come together to talk about the role of compassion, whether there is compassion in their businesses or government level, and how they can get it going if there isn't. So it was a dialogue to open up, a cross-disciplinary dialogue to open up a discussion about it, but then lead to action. And we had a list of non-governmental organizations that people from the community could then go to to actually do something about when they, when they learn uh, about the different topics in, in the uh, conference. We've also been very fortunate to get some seed money from His Holiness the Dalai Lama to create a new center for compassion, creativity, and innovation. And that center, that, by the way, that's a picture of the woods on the west side nature preserve on my campus. It's a great place to, to go and just to get, a, get away from everything and think. And that center is acting as a resource hub for our local communities, of getting them together to actually do something in their communities, from immigrate, immigration communities to uh, women's health center to veterinary clinics. And we're combining them, linking them together so that we can solve the problems in our local communities right then and there. But then the centers also, we've also started helping other universities and cities and towns outside of Connecticut, Oxford University, we're helping the College of New Jersey, the University of Hartford, so that we can take the value of compassion to their neck of the woods as well. So it's not just centered right around the Fairfield County area, we're looking to branch out to help other, other centers through the generosity of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now from the woods to the concrete and virtual worlds, and why would I put that up? Well scientists have just come up with self-healing concrete, right? So when concrete, by the way, that's a picture of my walkway in my front, front yard. Uh, so it's cracking. I don't have self-healing cr concrete. That idea sparked for me that what compassion is. When a, com when a community has compassion woven through it, it's a self-healing property 
for that community. We should be looking at compassion in that way. Now, why do I have Minecraft up there? For those of you who have played it, you know you can build your own worlds. You can build them in the sky, on clouds. You can build them underwater. I sound like Dr. Seuss right now. You can build them anywhere you want. And my oldest boy, Cade, he loves this, and he shows me his worlds all the time. And I asked him why he likes it so much. And he said, Dad, I can build any world I want, anywhere I want, and I love living in it. I love surviving in it. And all I could think of is, wow, why aren't we doing that in our world? Why are our kids building these worlds, these virtual worlds? They're so proud of that. Shouldn't we be building our real world that we're proud to give our kids? A world that they more than want to survive in, that they want to live in? We can do that if we build a concrete world of compassion for them. And I've given you the five ways that we've done it. When we're a small public university, if we can do it, anybody can do it anywhere. And on a closing note, all I can think of is when I talk about compassion, some people see it, see compassion as a weakness. But when compassion is woven through a community, it's its source of strength. Thank you.